Hi, everyone. Welcome back. We hope you were able to take those five minutes to refresh, re-energize, start thinking about some of these questions. And we are really excited to present to you today. So we'll jump right in. So this is our session, Designing an Intentional and Equitable Hiring Process. Um, we are working together with two groups, Cross College Advising Service and the Career Exploration Center. We'll talk more about our team and the process as we go on. But before we start, I'd like to share just a couple practical pieces of information that will help this presentation be hopefully the most useful for you. First, we want to reiterate that there is a worksheet that we've created that is a helpful um, accompanying piece that you can actually see and use right now. If you go to the page where you attended, push the attend button for our session, there is um, a worksheet or additional handout that you can click and download. And we'll be following through that worksheet as we talk through our presentation today. So feel free to do that if you'd like. We also want you to know that you will get these slides after the whole entire forum is done. So you'll have this access um, as well as the, the worksheet that we're talking about. We hope to talk to you for about the next 45 minutes and then we are saving time at the end, hopefully 20 to 30 minutes where we can dig into some of your questions and really help provide answers um, that maybe we've experienced or suggestions, advice. Um, we love to just talk through the process. So we'll have time for that at the end. Please feel free to put those questions that you want us to see in the Q&A section on your screen. There also is a place for, for group questions that we're going to pose to you. And this is an opportunity for you to talk amongst yourselves. So when we pose those questions, feel free to put your answers in the chat box so that you and others that are attending can see what you have to say. We want it to be a way to have more of an interactive um, engaging way to participate in this session. So feel free to use this chat box for you to kind of put in, share your ideas with your other colleagues that are joining us and all of the other attendees. But again, if you have a question for us, put that in the Q&A. You can click on the PowerPoint version or you can pop that out if you'd like to see that a little bit bigger. Um, just wanted to remind you about that. And finally, we know that discussing bias it can be difficult at times, and so we want to remind you um, to take care of yourself in whatever way you need, and um, we support that 100%. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it on to the microphone, the virtual microphone, to my colleague um, and uh, fellow facilitator, Jonathan Ferguson, to talk about um, the first part of our session. So Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thanks, Gail. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, again, my name is Jonathan Ferguson. Um, that's me floating in there on the bike. Uh, at this time, it's always important to keep things that bring us joy front of mind, especially at this time, and biking is one of those things. So that's my bitmoji. I'm director of the Career Exploration Center and one of the presenters today. I will be joined by uh, Alex Mock, who's the assessment coordinator in Cross College Advising Service. Brian Bischel, who is Assistant Director and Academic Advisor in Cross College Advising Service. Uh, Gail, who you've uh, met already. Megan Armstrong, also an Academic Advisor in Cross College Advising Service. And then, uh, last but certainly not least, Kayla Grove, um, uh, who is now Assistant Director for Advising Training and Pre Professional Development in the Office of Undergraduate Advising. Um, for a little bit of context, I just want to provide you all some background on our offices, uh, Cross College Advising Service and the Career Exploration Center. We're student advising offices that work with the students who are exploring majors and careers. Uh, we typically have about total 25 professional staff uh, in our offices combined and about 50 student staff. Uh, in the office as well, in the offices as well. So we hire frequently, so this was a topic near and dear to our hearts. About two years ago, this team came together to review and improve our hiring process for the professional staff in both of our departments, and our work has continued through, uh, through to today, really, and it's ongoing. All right, next slide, please. All right, so our presentation overview. 
so today we're going to talk to you, uh, talk with you about um, uh, why we started our work, how we did that work, uh, what we did, and our results and some of our next steps. Uh, again, as we move through the session, uh, it would be great um, for you all to participate in the chat to share your ideas and thoughts with the community. Um, and we'll have a few chat polls and also pose your questions to us in the Q&A session. So that's what we're going to go over today. Um, and to begin with, next slide, please. Um, <laughs> we started our process with that, uh, that important question, why? It's always important to start with why in a lot of cases. So, and we did in order to pinpoint the specific problems that we faced in our hiring process. We were aware of some of those problems, um, but there were a lot of the problems in our process we didn't discover until we really took a step back and looked at things holistically. Um, of course, during the hiring process, or during the process of reviewing our hiring process, we recognized that we were doing some really good things and we were hiring really good people. Uh, but what we found is that um, those people were being hired not necessarily um, as a result of our hiring process. It was something that they got through and somehow we were able to hire them. So it wasn't really supporting us. Um, it just was something that those great people got through and we wanted to make our hiring process actually um, help those folks get connected to our team. So ultimately, um, we identified several critical problems with our hiring process, and some of those are going to be identified on the next slide. Okay, so you'll see the problems that we um, identified, and I won't spend tons of time on all of them, but I do want to talk about three, and those are highlighted. Um, our hiring process was slow and inefficient. So um, there were sometimes we'd have a position posted, it would close, and then we'd have um, <laughs> someone hired in that position somewhere between three and six months after the fact that the position closed. And so as a result of that, we lost some really good candidates just because the process was extended. We wanted to shorten that. Um, we had a lack of clear direction regarding office needs and values. Um, a great example of that is um, when we came together, we all finally articulated and, and knew that um, commitment to social justice and equity was something that was really important to our office. However, if you were to look at any of our position descriptions, um, that wasn't evident. So if I'm an applicant and I'm looking at a position description and I have a strong commitment to social justice and equity, um, I can't recognize that this office that I might want to apply to actually shares that commitment. Um, so it's likely we lost candidates before they even applied and we, we needed to improve that. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, um, unknown and unconscious bias. We wanted to make sure that the process was pure um, and that all applicants um, it had a good experience. And not only that, uh, bias was minimized towards evaluating, evaluating their materials, interviews, so on and so forth. That's really, really critical for any office that claims to have a value in social justice and equity. And it was really important to us. All right. Next slide, please, Gail. All right, so a couple of our goals and objectives, again, were to minimize bias. Uh, let me make sure I don't lose anything on my notes here. Um, that was very, very important to us, as I just mentioned. Uh, increasing the diversity of our staff. Our staff was already very diverse, and all staffs typically are, because diversity can be um, uh, can be uh, measured uh, in many different ways, and there are many different types of diversity, as an example. Um, if you think about the team in your office, there's probably a lot of different approaches to planning, a lot of different approaches to what systems to use, and just personality traits. So that's a lot of diversity right there. That's really important. Um, but also, it was important for us <laughs> to be clear that we wanted to uh, improve and increase the what I call visible diversity of our staff. Um, as an office that works with students across campus who comes from who come from a variety of backgrounds, it's important for them to be able to see very quickly when they look at our office and our staff and our work to see diversity and to see themselves represented in what we do. Um, and so it was important for us to increase the diversity of our staff uh, in lots of different ways, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and the last three there you'll hear a lot about. 
uh, in, the re in the remainder of the presentation. So um, get ready for that. There's going to be lots of good information there. Um, so next slide, please. What we want to do is give you all a chance to actually think about the challenges you have experienced in the hiring process. And that could be as a, an applicant. Um, it could be as someone who is part of the hiring team, or it could even be just things that you imagine might be challenges in the hiring process at UW-Madison somewhere on our campus. So please type those in the chat, and um, we'll give you about uh, 15 seconds to do that, and then we'll move on with the presentation. So we'll just take a little bit of reflection time here. All right, I know that wasn't tons of time, um, but again, um, it's important that uh, you all have the opportunity to share your thoughts uh, with the community here. And then if you have questions, certainly please post those in the Q&A. All right, so I'll turn things over to Brian to take us uh, into the next part of the session. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, as John said, my name is Brian Bischel. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm one of the assistant directors at the Cross College Advising Service. What I'm going to talk about here is um, how our project team worked together. I'm also going to say a little bit about the candidate experience before turning it over to Alex to talk about the search and screen committee process. So how we work together. Um, we recognized uh, early on that the committee, that the, the, the project team that we have here was comprised of, of folks in our office who have come from a wide variety of experiences and positions. So we had somebody on our team um, who was here for only six months and then others who've been uh, um, part of CSAS, part of campus for over 20 years. So we wanted to make sure that we created uh, a way to work together that sort of leveled everything for all of us. Um, given our different roles or different responsibilities, we wanted to make sure that each person felt free and open to being, being able to um, provide input, to provide critique, to look at how things had gone in the past and, and and offer those suggestions without feeling like they were also, <clears throat> um, uh, it, that it was an applied critique of the person who'd been in the room the longest. So we created this thing that we call uh, some community standards that we call the Bascom Accord. If you could have the next slide, please, Gail. So the Bascom Accord were, was our community standards. Um, this is a statement of our values, and this um, applied to the work that we did as part of our project team. And we also now apply this as uh, to the work of all um, future search and screen committees, that this is, this is the foundation on which we want, we want those to operate. The, um, the most important of these really is speak your truth. Speak your truth also has a kind of a flip side, which is to hear others' truths, right? And so, um, and really what it does is, uh, it functions more or less as a mandate. Um, it's a commitment to not be silent throughout the process of reviewing a hiring process through, and also through reviewing, reviewing candidates um, who might be applying to work with us. These guidelines enable us to move forward um, and to identify areas of concern, uh, whether that be the position description for the jobs that we're hiring, how to evaluate candidates, how to interview candidates. Uh, we also recognize um, that anytime you're in a process like this, um, it's gonna be really important that people do speak up so that we can return to previous decisions as we sort of learn more about bias. We learn more about ourselves. Uh, we learn from other campus resources about what things work and what, don't, and what things do not work so well. We also recognize that hiring is, in its core, a sort of a subjective process. I'm an individual person reading an application and I'm gonna have some thoughts and some ways of interpreting or um, uh, um, ingesting what it is that I'm seeing. So um, recognizing that um, a big part of what we're doing is, is, is um, reviewing the work of people who are applying to work with us. Um, we also find it really important that, it's, that we respect the efforts of candidates at each level of this process. Um, if you could switch slides, please, Gail. Um, 
And so we wanted to focus on the candidate experience. Um, the, the commitment to respecting candidates' efforts leads us to reconsider how applicants um, experience our process when they apply to work with us. We also recognize that um, certain parts of our process um, in the past may have felt somewhat adversarial, um, that people feel like they need to sort of prove something, that we're gatekeepers, and we really want to make sure that what we're trying to do is provide a place for people to show us their best, their best work. I know many of us, I personally have experienced um, long drawn out um, long drawn out hiring processes where you don't know if you are still a candidate, have they moved on, um, when are you going to hear something. And so what we did is we made some changes and those changes really do um, mostly uh, um, live in the sort of planning and communication side of things. Um, the first thing that we did is we revised our position description. Uh, to provide a more clear view of what the job is like, what it's like to work with us, to provide a roadmap for candidates to follow when they are applying to work with us. Um, and Alex is going to say more about the PD later. Uh, and I just want to make sure also that, you know, a part of this process is to um, remove the veil so that there aren't any hidden agendas um, behind how candidates are going to be evaluated. The next thing that we did is we created a timeline. So each search and screen um, will have a timeline. And our goal is to try to um, complete the process of, of uh, reviewing materials, interviewing, and hiring in four to five weeks after the close of the position description, which um, is a pretty ambitious um, timeline. And, uh, but it's one that, that speaks to some of the things that John talked about earlier. The other part of this process um, is to then communicate with people. And so now the way that we, ha we function is that at the end of um, every, uh, when, a, when, a, when an open position closes and we're no longer, no longer receiving applicants, we send each individual um, an email that has our timeline. This is when we're going to be reviewing. This is when we're going to be inviting people for semi-finalist interviews. This is when we're going to be inviting people for finalist interviews. At the semifinalist interview, or before that, actually, when we invite people to interview with us, we provide them with the topics ahead of time that we're going to want to discuss with them. And we do this because we are opening our, um, hopefully, opening up to folks who, who work outside of higher education. And this will level the playing field for those folks who are coming from a non-higher ed, back, higher ed background. And then during the finalist interviews, we also provide questions. Um, printed versions or uh, if it's an online process, um, dropping questions in the chat so that finalists can focus on the, the conversation we're trying to have with them and not on taking notes and trying to remember and, and things like that. Ultimately, our goal here is that candidates, whether regardless of how the outcome is for them, that they feel like they've won the day, that they felt supported, that they felt valued, that we really did want to learn more about them as a whole person and not just as someone who could answer some questions. And we want them to feel really good about CCAS, about the process that they've been in, about working at UW-Madison, about working at the Career Exploration Center. So now that you've had an opportunity to learn more about um, our process and our emphasis on candidate experience, um, feel free to take 15 seconds and drop in the chat um, uh, one way that you go that in your hiring process, you could help candidates feel like they've won the day. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And then also want to remind you that if you do have questions, please drop them in the, the Q&A chat. Okay, so now I want to turn this over to Alex, who's going to talk more about the search and screen experience. All right, thank you, Brian, and hello, everyone. My name is Alex Mock. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the assessment coordinator for Cross College Advising Service. Uh, so for this portion, I'm gonna talk more about what did we actually do, share some of those technical details around how we tried to minimize bias in our process, and then also talk more about our overall process in developing uh, the interview materials and then criteria and things like that um, to hopefully help you in your future search and screens. So first up, uh, the steps we took to minimize bias. Um, if there were four takeaways you could leave with, here's some of them. Uh, the first one is uh, redacting. Second one, using a rubric. Third one, recording where possible. 
And then the fourth one, finally, relaxing and trusting your process. Um, so a little bit more about each of these. With redacting, um, this was a recommendation that came to us from our uh, consultation with HR representatives, which was name bias is a major thing in written materials. There are plenty of studies around that. Um, and so when possible, simply removing candidate names um, can reduce a lot of that initial bias when evaluating candidates' written materials. Um, the goal here being we're really allowing people who are qualified and show that in their written materials to progress into the next uh, rounds of the process and not get distracted or unconsciously um, biasing against certain names. The second one here is using a rubric. Uh, we, I'm going to talk a little bit more about using uh, the rubric and how it can be designed um, in a really thoughtful way, but this as a big thing uh, helps to kind of standardize and keep evaluators and committee members consistent um, and again being really clear about what you are looking for in your positions and in your candidates. The third one here is record. Uh, so as Brian hinted to earlier, uh, when we do interviews, especially now virtually, um, recording them is a really helpful step. Uh, this allows when you're sitting down with an interview, doing the interview, um, if you're recording, committee members can focus on just asking the questions, candidates can focus on answering the questions, and no one's trying to rush uh, to take notes, maybe miss important things, um, or well, one of the most important things, there we go. Uh, and then later on, because they're recorded, committee members can then watch those recordings at their own time and leisure and make sure they're spending really good quality of time with what's being shared with us uh, to make appropriate evaluations. And then the last one is relax and trust the process. So all throughout a lot of this, um, we're trying to do is reduce the times that we are changing what we're doing, shifting criteria, um, and creating an inconsistent experience uh, for different candidates or for the committee. And so when we say relax and trust the process, we mean respect the amount of thought and time you've put into putting together a really good hiring situation. Um, and then if things come up where you're like, oh, I'm not liking how this answer happened or I'm really concerned about this, uh, this interaction with the candidate, um, those are valid. And then to talk with your committee to make sure like if we change anything, how are we gonna make sure it's still going to be fair for everyone else? And a lot of times it's probably best to just stick with what you already have. Um, and so that's what we say here by relax. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that too later. So those are four things you can do to minimize bias. But here for the next thing I wanna talk about is our defined process. So we wanna talk through a little bit our, um, how we thought through creating our entire interview experience. So. As you can see here on the slides, it started with creating that position description, clearly communicating to uh, candidates what our office is looking for, uh, the values that we have, and how this informs everything else that follows going to the criteria, the rubric, and the questions. Um, so we'll talk about more of each of these in turn. Okay, so here's our position description, and this is just an excerpt of what we posted for an advisor position. So CCS seeks an individual who is interested in working with undecided and exploring students and demonstrates the ability to foster and promote the values of diversity and inclusion. Um, we had a whole list of other values. We picked this one uh, because it was a major priority and very uh, apt for many of the goals that we were trying to reach uh, and achieve that John and Brian said earlier. So that's the one we're highlighting. Uh, at this point, I'm going to remember and say, if you had a chance to take a look at our handout, uh, what I'm about to describe actually is kind of going through that handout and using the example here uh, to guide you through our thought process. And then um, there's spaces in the handout too for you to reflect on your own process and see how these steps can maybe um, work for you in your office and your hiring needs. So anyways, here's our position description. This is a major value for us, so we stuck it right there in the position description for all candidates to see. Okay, so when we're looking at our process as a whole, there we go. That's number one. That's our value um, that we want to focus on, and that feeds into next how we want to evaluate it. So the criteria step then is deciding what are the values, how do you want to know which uh, candidates have strengths uh, in the qualities that you're looking for. So in this case, I mean, we have a series of set numbers, so 0, 1, 3, 5, and 7. 
and each one has some descriptive text that as a committee we discuss to figure out, okay, when we say zero or one or seven, what does that mean uh, in general? And listed those out here. Uh, when we're using our criteria, something that was again, uh, recommended to us also is to stick to very discrete categories. So when we're finally grading people or evaluating people on uh, and applying a number to their different qualities, um, to use exactly just these five numbers and not stick in like a 3.22 or a 457 and get stuck in the what does that actually mean? Because um, the number isn't necessarily important. It's being able to justify why I gave a candidate this level of um, evaluation for that criteria. So yeah, so now we have the values that we want, We've got some criteria, um, and then finally to the rubric stuff now is putting those two things together. So here's just a quick snippet of a larger spreadsheet that we use for our rubrics. And it's a culmination of the things from what we've kind of already said to candidates um, prior. So there's no shifting of meanings or definitions. It's very, very direct, very linear. So we want to see demonstrated ability too. And then there's that first value again, foster and promote values of diversity and inclusion for our advisors. Um, and in here, just for comparison's sake, we wanted to add a second value. So works effectively and collaborate as a member of a team. Um, real quick, you'll notice that these two things have different max ranges and scores. Uh, this is intentional. So both of these are still important. We want our candidates to have these qualities and when we actually hire them to work on our team. Um, but we wanted to have certain values to allow candidates to really shine through in those areas or these are things that we really want to apply more weight to um, so that when we're evaluating candidates, we can see who has distinct strengths uh, in these areas. And so here you can see where the first one has seven and the other one has a max of five. Um, so when you're sitting down with committees and discussing your values and your criteria and ultimately your rubric, um, this is how you can have the weights changed um, so that those who move on to the next rounds really have these qualities that you're looking for. Okay, so let's move to the sum pages again. Yeah, so these three steps, um, there you have them all informing one after the other. And I'm about to turn it over to Kayla here, who's gonna explain how all of this informs how we craft our questions. Thanks, Alex. Hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Grove, and my pronouns are she and hers. And I work with the Office of Undergraduate Advising as Assistant Director for Advising, Training, and Professional Development. So Alex has shared how the initial position description links through the criteria and the rubric. And I'm going to continue to share what that linkage looks like as we consider the interview question portion of our evaluation process. So as we continue with our example of foster and promote the values of diversity and inclusion, we're going to share with you the interview questions we ask candidates that address the same theme in both our semi-finalist Skype interviews and then our finalist interviews that we've done both in person and virtually, depending on the time. So our first round interviews, our semi-finalists, we ask candidates, what have you done recently to further your understanding of the experiences of people whose identities are different from your own? And what impact does this have in your understanding on your work? And then as we move to the finalist round, we asked how you create an open and inclusive space for all students. And please tell us about a time you have done this. So as you can see, this continues to link to that topic of foster and promote the values of diversity and inclusion throughout the entire evaluation process. This is something we really valued and cared about in our candidates, and so is what we wanted to be focusing on. We also wanted to note here, we did not allow for follow-up questions during our interview process. So we were told by HR that follow-up questions tend to be asked when we really like or connect or relate to a candidate. Therefore, follow-up questions allow for some candidates to share more information than others. And so this is an additional spot where bias can often creep into an interview process. Thus, we eliminated that option. So as you can see here, this example continues from start to finish of the evaluation process, from the position description to the rubric, criteria, and then through both rounds of the interview, we kept the focus on this specific area of qualities or skills we were looking for. So as Alex mentioned, this is just one example. We obviously had more than just this we were looking for in our candidates, but we did this same process for every one of those pieces. 
And then this also highlights that throughout this process, we essentially really narrowed the focus of the search and screen members to only be able to evaluate this criteria we decided we wanted to focus on in our candidates. Their skills, abilities, and qualities we had determined were really important for our ultimate hire. And we determined this as we were crafting the PBL or the position description. So we couldn't rank on things outside of these predetermined criteria or areas. The process didn't allow for that. And thus it reduced at least parts of bias in our process because it really streamlined the committee focus. And so as was mentioned, we really did come to trust this process. And I'll speak to that a little bit more um, as I speak to what our meetings looked like and how we went through this and had conversations about this as a group during the evaluation process. But first, we wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions that may be sitting with you right now about what we just shared. So I'm going to give you a minute and please put in the question and answer box. What questions do you have about this process? And what is coming up for you about what we just shared? And so we'll put that summary there and we are going to move into a Q&A in just a little bit. And so we're going to save the questions that you're posing now for that Q&A. Okay, so please keep those questions coming. Thank you. So we just kind of summarized um, what that evaluation process looked like, but now we really want to talk about how we as a committee discussed that evaluation process and made it come to life. So as Alex mentioned, we redacted names and gave each candidate a number. So you can hear, see that here on the slide. Um, we ranked candidates according to our rubrics that we had created. And then each candidate was reviewed by three search and screen members. When we came together as a group, we each listed our top 15 candidates. So our top 15 highest ranked candidates out of, so for me, out of everyone I reviewed, who was that top 15? So you can see example of that image here. Um, I'm KG on the left. And so those were the top 15 candidates I reviewed based on this random number they were given. We chose 15 to rank, um, not to rank, but to just list on this board because simply of how many folks we wanted to hire to or bring to our first round interview process. So we gave ourselves a buffer to that number, but then you would choose how many folks you wanted to list here based on your candidate number goals and how many folks you wanted to be inviting to that first round interview process. I think it's really important to note here that I might be an easier grader than Alex. So for example, I may have given folks a seven on something when he gave them a five. But as long as I was consistent within my own scoring on that rubric, we never even discussed the specific rubric totals of a candidate. So really what we were focusing on is my top candidates and those would rise to the top of my list. So my top 15 and Alex's top 15 would rise to the top of his list. And so our process accounted for the varied ways we slightly might use the rubric because we were really just ranking folks um, according to our own lists. So you can see here that the circles um, that are here are those candidates who are listed in this top group across all three of their reviewers. So on my list on the far left there, you can see that my top nine or so candidates were also ranked in that top 15 by their other two reviewers. So based on this visual, you can see we saw really high consistency in this process. Nearly all these candidates who were ranked high by one reviewer were also ranked high by other reviewers. And so we really came to trust this process and the rubric. So thus there was really high validity in our process across reviewers. Now, there were times when someone had a candidate they felt strongly about and had ranked high, um, ranked in their top 15, who wasn't ranked high by other search and screen committee members. And what we really like about this process is there's a nice visual to highlight that very easily. And this allowed us to address that. So um, one example Megan said I could share on her behalf, she had ranked a candidate quite high and they came up in her top 15 and that same candidate had not been ranked highly by other reviewers. And so this was an opportunity because the visual showed us that then Megan could go back, review those candidates materials. And as she did that, she realized that this candidate actually had a residence life experience 
and so does Megan. And so um, in speaking her truth and addressing this with the group, realized that she was actually biased towards this candidate, and that might have been what led her to rank the candidate higher than they had been ranked by other reviewers. So um, it was a nice process to be able to pause, dig into some of the discrepancies that we saw, and then again, ultimately really, really encouraged us to trust this process. So the current slide is what this looked like as we came together in a committee in person, but we also did this process um, more recently in virtual options, yeah. And so this is what it looked like, essentially the same thing, but just virtually. Um, and so something else I want to note that was really a neat experience for me in this is I've been a part of other search and screen committees and processes where when we came together as a group, this was a tricky conversation to have. Um, there was a lot of nuance and sometimes confusion over what we were really looking for. And so what I think, at least I really loved about this process, is it was very clear and very apparent. Um, our strong candidates according to the rubric, which is according to the PVL or the position description, which was, again, really according to what we wanted in our candidates, those floated to the top with a lot of ease. And so determining who was going to move along in our process was actually quite easy if we really followed this process. Um, one other thing I wanted to note is that we did this same process for beyond our first round um, interviews as well, and we simply used the names of the folks once we, we knew who they, they were. So that is in summary what our process looked like. And I'm going to hand it over to Megan now, who's going to discuss some of our results and ongoing work. Awesome. Thanks, Kayla. Um, so again, my name is Megan Armstrong, and I am an academic advisor with CCAS. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about our summary. So what have we created? What did we learn? And how is it working two years down the road? Um, so overall, we really did have this opportunity to beta test our ideas during two different searches as we we're actively creating and refining this process. And we really used what we were learning during those searches in order to continue making changes and adjusting in order to get to the process that we shared with you today. And what we found is that a systematic approach really leads to efficiency and minimizing bias, as Alex laid out for you when he went through the first part of the process. Um, the steps are clearly articulated, and so this leaves little room for interpretation, and also it does minimize the ability for bias to enter the conversation, or when it does, as Caleb pointed out, it really allows us, we have to name it, we have to speak to it, we have to identify what that bias is, um, and ultimately it keeps the process streamlined and focused on the criteria that we laid out from the very beginning, as Kayla just shared with you. Furthermore, we did achieve our goal of attracting a broader, more diverse field of candidates. Um, so going all the way back to what John shared at the very beginning, this included both visible and invisible facets of diversity. Um, and not only did we attract a more diverse field of applicants, but we actually selected and interviewed a more diverse pool of candidates than we had in the past. And we're going to come back to that in a few slides. Additionally, we enhance communication by developing a greater understanding of the roles and needs of everyone who's involved in the hiring process. And you can see a list there of some of those key um, constituents in the hiring process. And as Brian shared, it was really key for us to keep in mind that candidates are interviewing us just as much as we are interviewing them. Um, and so making this a great experience and inclusive and welcoming for them as well. And lastly, uh, we improved the experience for our campus partners, um, helping to build a better reputation for our offices on campus and bridging relationships across what can be a very siloed campus. So continuing then with campus partners, just to say a little bit more about the folks outside of CCAS who have joined our searches. Um, in those first two beta searches, the hiring project team who you've seen here today really was the primary members of those search and screen committees. But in each of those searches, we did have one other external campus partner. Um, it was really valuable to get their feedback and their insight in the process because they were the only person in that search and screen that wasn't knee deep and totally invested in developing this process. So they were able to be objective and hopefully critical of us in a way that was just different than those of us who were doing that day in and day out. 
And so you can see a quote here from one of our campus partners. And what they're really pointing to is that they had a very clear sense of the needs and values of our office. And this gave them a way to go about evaluating candidates that's consistent with the needs we laid out. And they were able to feel valued throughout the entire process and use their time and expertise to provide input, perspective, and of course, sharing their mandated truth because they were not exempt from those basketball court standards either. And so now what? What does this mean? Where have we come from? Where do we go from here? Um, so we have continued to use this process over the past two years. Um, and we've since hired seven different staff members utilizing this process. Um, and we're proud to say that these are diverse staff members. Um, and this is both NCCAS and the CEC. And you can see a brief list of those on the slide. And this diversity really comes in terms of educa educational backgrounds, professional experiences, and social identities, particularly those from underrepresented and marginalized backgrounds. Uh, we also really want to point out that we have hired high quality people who have really jumped in and are engaging with our staff. Um, and it's awesome because they were hired on their qualifications. So they were allowed to speak to their experiences and what makes them qualified and they were hired because of those qualifications. Furthermore, we've since adapted. Um, we did end up forming a peer hiring project team, and we were able to adapt the professional process to the student staff hiring process. Um, and really in that we were carrying this value of diversity throughout our organization. So realizing how important it was that we were hiring student staff that are also representative of the student body population as well. Um, throughout this time, we've continued to examine our bias and refine the process, and this really comes from speaking our truth. Um, in every search and screen committee, every member is expected to speak their truth and examine their bias, and we've been able to adapt the process because of that. Uh, we've also continued to invo involve more staff members on each search and screen committee. So the hiring project team has slowly uh, removed ourselves from those committees. And we have one to two of us on each committee in order to train them, teach them about our process, and make sure that they are following along. Um, but we want everyone in our office to be fully trained and invested on this hiring process so that anyone can really open the hiring kit that we've put together and implement the process without concern. Uh, and lastly, we're doing things like what we're doing today. We want to share our process, experience, and materials with the broader community in the hopes that it might help others on campus and other spaces continue to challenge the way that we approach hiring and address systematic biases and bring great people into our campus and our organizations. So where we end today with the formal component of our presentation is one last of those awesome group chats. So thinking about your next steps, um, if you take a moment and think back to some of those concerns and flaws that you identified at the very beginning of our presentation, um, go ahead and throw into the chat something that you can take back to your office and implement. All right, and so with that, I'm going to pass that microphone back over to Gail, who's going to wrap us up, and we'll head into some Q&A. Okay, All right, thank you, Megan, and thank you, rest of the team. Um, it's always great to go through this process. A lot of time and thought and energy um, was put into this, and um, we're just really excited to share it out and also get feedback. And the questions coming in, there are so many. It's awesome. And we appreciate your um, engagement, your interaction. And we want to do our best to get through um, as many as we can right now um, for the next 20 minutes or so. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, I will uh, say the question, and then um, I will hand it off to one of my fellow colleagues to answer it. But I also welcome um, our entire group to add in if you have something else that you'd like to say. Um, we, like I said, are going to do our best to go through as many as we can right now, but there are definitely more than we're going to be able to get to. So at the very end, the last couple of minutes, we will put up our contact information and um, be able to 
welcome you to reach out to us with any other questions or if we didn't get to your question, please reach out to us because we love talking to this. So I think I'm going to start um, with one of our first que or a question that came in. Um, and John, I'm going to, to direct this one to you. But the question that came in is, how do you define and measure diversity? Does this differ from employment representation? Thanks, Gail. Um, so I guess I'm going to hold on there for a second because I feel like I wanted to mention something earlier that I'm sure came up, but I promised myself I would say this. So I'm going to do. I'm going to keep my promise to myself. Uh, so our everything that um, you all have seen here today and what we did and what we're continuing to do. Um, are our best efforts to minimize a problem that's, in my opinion, pretty serious on our campus about uh, bias in the hiring process. Um, if you were to ask me if I think our process is perfect, no, I do not. Um, I think this has been a, a lot of work from us just coming together and saying we value this and we need to do something. Um, and we're going to talk with people who we think are experts in the area and come up with something that we think works to take steps towards improvements. And so I encourage everybody who's on the call here today to um, embody that spirit and do what they can as individuals and a group to combat this issue. Okay, so now that I've said that, <laughs> which I promised myself I would, um, I'll do my best to answer this question. So how do you define and measure diversity? Um, and then does this differ from employment representation? So I guess I'll start with the second question because I'm, I'm not sure I follow that piece. Uh, maybe we can dig a little bit more for our, um, the person who posted the question. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll focus on the first one. Um, defining and measuring diversity, I think, is um, done in how your department um, values difference. Diversity in itself, I believe the dictionary definition of that is variety and difference, something to that extent. So when we were looking at this, we were looking at valuing difference in people and knowing that that's going to improve our work overall. And so um, oftentimes the most important or can be the most important differences are those that are clear and seen. Um, so when you think about gender identity, when you think about age, when you think about culture, when you think about race, ethnicity, those of those things, those things I think are clearly very important. Um, but there are lots of different ways um, that 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 diversity can be seen or measured as well. So those are some of the things that we were thinking about when we were looking at different types of diversity, but mainly we're looking for an appreciation of difference and coming together and working together. So that's how I would answer the question. Um, and we're continuing to work on that now. Just like anything else, this is an evolving thing that we're trying to get better at. Thanks, John. All right, next question. Um, and I'll probably direct this to Brian and maybe Kayla too, but what advice do you have to attract a more diverse applicant pool? So again, what advice do you have to attract a more diverse applicant pool? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, so this is a really good question and it's one that we struggle with um, and we talked a lot of, um, quite a bit about recruiting as uh, part of our hiring process and we didn't really touch on that today, mostly because this is so broad and expansive that we did really wanna focus today on um, what happens when you have an open position and what do you do next. Um, the, uh, the recruiting piece of this, you know, one of the things that we do rely on are some of the institutional ways that um, uh, jobs get posted. And there is actually um, some significant, I think, geographical diversity in who does um, in some patterns and who applies for our jobs. Um, but the thing that, it will, that we've noticed <clears throat> um, and a big difference that we've noticed using the process that we have right now in compared to earlier times is that the um, uh, folks of color have always been applying for our jobs. We just didn't know it. Um, and some of that was the way in previous um, hiring practices that we uh, 
that we really did sort of work to unintentionally or not exclude candidates and we weren't evaluating on a really clear um, uh, clear rubric so the other thing that um, that we've done is you know in our position description we do try to um, state our values and our needs very clearly and we and I think that doing so also attracts um, a, a broader uh, array of candidates and in terms of outcome um, we've noticed that our um, our semifinalist pool if we're talking about as John sort of mentioned earlier sort of visible diversity um, that our, our, our semifinalists and finalist pools are are quite different than what they had been in the past um, because and, and it's simply through focusing on rubrics criteria and um, and the values that we've stated I others can speak to this more clearly you know uh, I think more eloquently about what are the ways to attract but I think being really clear about what we what we need and what we're looking for has helped us attract uh, a broader array of candidates Thanks, Brian. Kayla, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Uh, no, Brian covered what I was going to cover, just in sharing a bit more about our office values um, and specifically what we are looking for. So um, I'm not sure if this was said, but when we talked about our position description and revamping it, we revamped it quite a bit and we spent a lot of time being really intentional in that. And so of the few of the things that we were looking for, um, obviously was looking for folks who wanted to do the job, so working with undecided and exploring students, but then also thinking about this, um, fostering, promoting the values of diversity and inclusion, working effectively with a diverse community of students and staff, those were things we really valued. Um, and so I think just being more transparent about what we were looking for and what our office culture is like as well. Thanks, Kayla. Next question, um, Alex, I'll send it to you. Um, how do you create spaces where once hired, especially for people of color and folks with differing abilities, that they feel they belong at your organization? There's my mute button. Uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, so this one is a, it's a big conversation and it's also a little bit again after all the hiring happens. Um, but a few examples, at least from the CCS office, uh, one of it is from the top, from leadership, that this is a priority. Uh, when we were going through even designing this process, we had support um, from our directors saying, like, we want uh, staff to have a stronger sense of belonging. We want to increase our diversity. We want um, this to really be a place where all these different identities feel valued and want to be here. Um, and that also is reflected in how we develop our uh, internal committee structures on um, the types of opportunities and professional development um, activities that staff can engage in um, and then also how much we are reaching out to um, other resources on campus to constantly be interrogating how can we do better here's what we have here's what we're doing um, are there other steps we can be taking um, to make this place um, even uh, more inclusive and uh, a more positive experience for uh, our staff. And my mind is going through like a whole laundry list of things that we could do, but I think that's uh, a starting point um, for now, yeah. Thanks, Alex. All right, next question um, I'll send to Megan, and it says, this is in regards to hiring students. What information do you include in a position description to attract a diverse applicant pool? What questions do you ask in the application to get a sense of what the student knows or understands? And what questions do you ask in the interview? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and really, I know I shared very little bit at the end, but essentially about a year after the pro hiring process, project team, which is this group um, formed, we did end up hire, forming a peer hiring project team, and we really went through this exact same process. So we went back to those um, position descriptions that we use for our peers, and we really critically examined if what we were putting in those position descriptions and PVLs was truly what we wanted to see. 
Um, and as Alex just indicated in his last answer, it was really a matter of our leadership saying, this is what we want and this is the expectation for student staff. And also recognizing where students are at developmentally and that many students, unfortunately, are coming to college without much experience engaging in conversations around um, DEI work. Um, and I think if you look at the student body population of Madison, a lot of students haven't had to, right? Like, I think we can be honest and name that. Um, and so really the questions that we ended up asking in the interview process was a lot about growth mindset and wanting to see a willingness and a desire for students to engage in these conversations, that they wanted to continue learning about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And if they could show a growth mindset, then we were willing to hire that student knowing that we then had a responsibility to put together really great training materials as we onboarded those students staff and not just at the beginning of that student staff training um, but really pushing for ongoing training and ongoing conversations around um, DEI topics. Thanks Megan. Um, next question, um, I, I'll send it to John. Um, during the question asks, during the interview process, in order to attract a diverse pool of candidates, it's great to have a diverse interview panel. How do you not lean too heavily on your current employees who represent diverse backgrounds to participate on the interview panel? Yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, so I think, so one, I guess one thing I would say is attracting a diverse pool of applicants I think does go back before they an applicant even sees or interacts with an interview panel in any way, which some questions here have already alluded to. Um, and I think um, <laughs> uh, speaking towards some of the values of your department um, and, and, and applicants seeing how they fit into that across a variety of backgrounds and things like that helps attract those folks to apply for the job. So that's one thing um, that I think is important. Secondly, um, I think <laughs> uh, one of the ways to combat that is to have a diverse staff to begin with, so you're not constantly going to the same people over and over and over, because you don't need to, because you have lots of difference throughout your staff overall. So it's that challenge can be helped by just naturally having diversity within your staff. So um, you're not necessarily hitting the same people up every single time there's a search um, to provide that that, that uh, perspective or representation. Um, secondly, I think um, working with campus partners and having external views um, on your committees is also helpful. Um, like your department might only be a few people, um, and so then you're gonna always go to the same people asking for these different perspectives. But if you open that up and form partnerships across the campus, especially this one so large, you'll have um, the ability to work with lots of different people who bring in different perspectives. So those are a couple of things that come to mind. Thanks, John. Um, next question, I'll, I'll head this to Kayla. Um, the question is, but is minimizing bias actually challenging bias in hiring? Cool, thank you. Um, and if any of my panelists want to jump into this as well after I share, I love that. Um, so when I think of this, I think of the status quo of what old hiring processes might have looked like and how they were really lacking in structure and therefore, in my opinion, really allowing bias to creep in. Um, I think old processes and other processes you've been a part of have really focused on fit. So who might be a good fit for this office and not what is in need? And actually, I attended the diversity forum many, many years ago and um, attended a session on hiring and they spoke to that. And that was the first time I'd heard that is, are you hiring for fit or need? And when I think about fit, um, in some of our offices, I mean, we're a primarily white institution. And so fit might feel like a white person. Um, and so when I think about what is in need in our office, we really needed advisors who were more diverse than staff currently were in a lot of different ways as we talked about what diversity means. And so um, for, 
I think for us, that process meant intentionality and really focusing on what our conversations and our evaluation were going to look like. And so we are minimizing the bias that used to exist in the process. Um, and so that was more structurally, I think, the things we've spoke to. Um, our group knew each other really well. And so I think the speak your truth was able to be implemented really well in our process. And I think that's important to note as well. Um, our group was able to share and felt comfortable sharing when we noticed bias coming up for ourselves. And so that could be this part of challenging bias in hiring is these more individual instances. So um, something that I think about a lot is what does this process of speaking your truth and their basket accord look like in other search and screen committees when people don't know each other as well and there might be more positionality at play there. So I do think that's an important question that we need to continue to ask as a group is what does this look like in other processes? Um, yeah. That's where I'll end that. Yeah, thank you, Kayla. That was great. Um, next question, um, I'll send it to Brian. How do you prioritize the accelerated screen and interview timeline, including campus colleague participation, while managing increased workload? Uh, thanks. That's a, that is a really great question. And it's I think it's, um, <clears throat> uh, it's one that, um, comes up for us even now when, uh, you know, um, it seems like whenever uh, we have an open position, it's also when we're in the middle of um, a really busy time, which might be all the time now. Um, and so I, you know, one of the things that I think is really important is to have plans in place before there's an actual opening and to understand what the, um, in your office, when are the, when are the periods where you're, extremely busy, one of the periods when maybe things um, ease up a little bit. The, and it, it's really critical to have a clear, I think, idea of, uh, of, of how you want this process to play out and then set forth a plan for how it's going to, to work. So when we have an opening in our office, I talk to my director and say, when do you want to have finalist interviews? based on closing date, when is it, when, you know, and is your schedule clear? And then we reverse engineer it from there and to try to figure out what can go where. Um, so I think it's just really important to have, to have plans in place. The next thing is to think about when we do ask members of our staff to be on search and screen committees, one of the things that we're looking at is their current workload. Do they have time and capacity for this? Um, if it's close, if there's something that they're working on that is coming up on deadline, then we have to make a value judgment about is this thing they're working on something that um, that can be put off for a little while or interrupted, um, or can we just adjust the, the the deadline? So we kind of work internally, and then we make hiring the priority. Uh, hiring our you know hiring is a is a it's a long term commitment to somebody. It's an important part of us um, expressing our values. And it's really exciting to, to bring a new person on, and we want to make sure that that, um, that experience is shared by as many people as possible. And then when looking for um, campus colleagues to, to invite to our search and screen committee, the first thing that, that we do is check in with that person's direct supervisor and ask them and say, you know, we'd really like to have um, uh, this person join our committee. Is this something that would work for, for them right now? Um, and, you know, here's our timeline. And we provide that to the person so that they understand what it is that we're asking of them. And we, it's a very defined process. So we have, um, we, you know, the meetings are already set and we know when we're going to meet, we know for how long and we know how often. And so we try to provide as much of that as we can ahead of time so that people can make decisions about what works for them. Thanks, Brian. Um, next question um, I'll send to Alex. So the, the question asks, how, practically speaking, did you redact the names off the resumes? Um, this person uses an applicant tracking system that forwards resumes. Did you download them, block out the names, save as PDFs, and then forward? Um, I'd also welcome suggestions on how to do that with academic CVs when the candidates provide a long list of publications, presentations, poster sessions, et cetera. 
And this might be more detail that we would be happy to share with that person individually too, but um, I think it's still an interesting process that um, we could share at least some general um, tips of how we did the redacting. Uh, yeah, so I can take a quick stab at this one. Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is for our process, so we redacted things essentially by hand. Um, so we have someone who is downloading PDFs, um, who is redacting and blocking out the names um, or any other information that that particular search uh, wants removed uh, or unseen. Um, this is a time-consuming step. Uh, ideally, you have ideally we have like the availability in terms of people, resources, time dedicated to set this up, um, so that the people who are ultimately reviewing those materials can just see a redacted information. Um, I hear there maybe are fancier programs that can do this automatically. We do not have access to those. Um, so this was done essentially by a person. Um, I guess one point about redacting I would point out is the person doing the redacting in this case was also not a part of uh, initial conversations about the search and screen. So they're not a part of the evaluation process because they have seen the materials. Um, so where possible, you try to isolate and separate those two steps. Um, in terms of longer CVs, I'm not entirely sure there. I would have to do some reading on that one. Um, for our context, it's primarily cover letters and resumes. Uh, and so for longer pieces, I'd be curious to see if there's any uh, research done out there or best practice recommendations for longer things. Um, but that would be an interesting area of investigation for me. Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, again, I think we're going to try and get at least one more question in. But want to reiterate, there were so many awesome questions and very um, thoughtful, um, challenging questions, great ones that we would love to talk with you more. So if we did not get to your question, um, after this next one, we'll put up a slide that has our contact information. We welcome you to reach out to us um, to continue these conversations um, because we want to continue to learn and grow and um, improve this process. So the final question is, um, we, we got a lot of these coming through kind of about the, is there a difference between asking clarifying questions versus follow-up questions? And I think that's something we've talked a lot about as a committee too. So um, I'll send it to Kayla um, and, and Brian, or you each can kind of put in a little bit of your, um, your input on that. Yeah, thanks. Um, and we had quite a few questions come up around the follow-up question piece. Um, when we were recently doing a little dress rehearsal, we actually got some questions about this from our mock audience. And I think there were some really good points. Um, someone had shared that in an interview they went through recently, someone asked a clarifying question simply because the person hadn't actually answered the full question. So that got me thinking about this candidates winning the day and how important it is that the candidates at least have a, a good understanding of the question and are able to address it. So um, what this is leaving me with is how can we make this more nuanced so that we can be sure that candidates are at least answering the question fully, um, that we're not trying to expand and get additional information from the above and beyond, but that they are really winning that question. Um, and I'll head it over to Brian in just a second, but I also wanted to share that there was another um, question about is there a way, another way to make it equitable for the candidates to ask questions and allow a department to give more information on the job or work environment beyond the position description, you know, if we aren't allowing for follow-up questions. Um, and so I just want to note that candidates are allowed to ask us questions. That's important to note here. Um, when we say follow-up questions, we really mean us asking candidates follow-up questions. But also a unique thing that I know CCS did it as a part of one of their process was they allowed candidates to actually meet with another member of the CCIS office who is not a part of the search and screen just to ask questions and gain more information as well. So that was another way. So we're thinking about candidates getting to know our office um, that allowed for that. And then Brian, is there anything you want to add? You might have a different opinion than me. Uh, yeah, um, just to, um, to add, in, add to that. One of the reasons why we went with this, and, and keep in mind, this is part of uh, a, a broader sort of hiring process, you know, where there's going to be an, uh, an interview with the director and uh, the hiring authority, the person's supervisor, et cetera. So there are going to be plenty of places for more conversational things to happen. But when we're talking about those initial um, uh, committee um, interviews with candidates that a lot of times in the um, people would, we would ask a question, um, the candidate wouldn't quite get it 
Aura would miss our mark. And if you, and then so staff members would ask a follow-up question to give them an opportunity to improve their answer, to, to, uh, to build on something. And a lot of times that happened because this was a candidate who they really, for some reason, felt some favor toward. And we're trying to, you know, maybe not intentionally, but sort of provide some help, but they wouldn't necessarily for every other candidate. So our no follow-up questions is really to make it clear to um, the people who are interviewing that we are, we've, we've put a lot of thought into the questions that we're asking, we're providing information ahead of time for so, so uh, candidates can feel more prepared. And then um, in the moment, we take what they give us. Um, it's, it's maybe not a perfect solution, um, but we wanted to make sure that every candidate has a very, has a parallel experience and a very similar experience to one that we met with previously and the one we're going to meet with after. Thanks, Brian and Kayla. Um, I know we're right up on our time limit. I want to, on behalf of our entire committee, um, send a big thank you. We were very honored um, and happy to speak with you all today and be given this opportunity. And we also send our sincere thanks and appreciation to the entire diversity forum planning team and committee. Um, this was one heck of an undertaking and it was a fantastic two day session. Still great sessions after our, ours as well. But we thank all of you for attending. Um, thank you to my fantastic group, um, Cross College Advising Service and the Career Exploration Center. Um, and most importantly, thank you to all of you attendees. Like we said, we did not get to all of your questions. There were so many, so on the screen, um, please direct your questions to, to my email right there, and I would be happy to um, follow up with our committee, and we will get back to you and figure out how we can continue these conversations. Um, you're also welcome to connect with us on our two different websites for our um, organization pages. So please feel free to follow up with us. This is an ever-evolving um, process, um, but we're so happy to be with you all here today, and thank you again. Have a great rest of the session. Um, Thank you all.